all of the manifestations of God have had establishers. Uh, Moses had Joshua. <coughs> Jesus had Paul. Uh, Muhammad has Ali. And then the eastern ones we might not be familiar with. Uh, Krishna has Arjuna. Buddha had Ananda. Zoroaster had King Vishtaspa. So all of them in the religious history of the world, the manifestations of God have had an establisher uh, <coughs> that has been able to take the revelation that was given and establish it amongst the people by communing with them, communicating with them in their culture and their language that they uh, could understand. So Baha'u'llah is no exception. Baha'u'llah also has an establisher of the Baha'i faith. And uh, now that we've gone over some of the history of the covenant of Baha'u'llah, we can see the violation of the hands. Uh, it's sure necessary that Baha'u'llah has, has an establisher come to reestablish uh, what the covenant breakers had uh, thrown out. Well, in the book, Some Answered Questions, uh, Abdul Baha, in explaining a commentary in the 11th chapter of the Re book of Revelation, uh, explains that Moses had Joshua, and then he says there's a fifth, sixth, and seventh angel mentioned in the book of Revelation. So he sets up this pattern uh, in this explanation of Moses' establisher being Joshua, and Muhammad's establisher being Ali. We know Jesus was Paul. He doesn't mention that one. And then uh, the sixth angel would be Kazus, the establisher of the Bab. And then he comes to the part where in the book of Revelation it mentions the seventh angel. And he goes ahead and describes uh, in prophetic terms that this would therefore be the establisher of the Baha'i faith. So the reason we're starting to read this is I wanted everybody to see that since the turn of the century, uh, Abdu'l-Baha had promulgated and it was known that there was a personage who would come in the future uh, that would be the establisher. So just within the Baha'i writings itself, this concept's not foreign. It's uh, given by Abdu'l-Baha, the center of the covenant. And here's the verse from Revelation. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then Abdu'l-Baha explains, The seventh angel is a man, qualified with heavenly attributes, who will arise with heavenly qualities and character. Well, okay, well, when I was growing up and I heard people talk about an angel, I thought maybe I saw too much Peter Pan, but like a little Tinkerbell or something like this, or you imagine some ethereal being in the sky. But here Abdu'l-Baha is telling us that, this, that an angel is a man, you know, a man qualified with heavenly attributes, will arise with heavenly qualities and character. So it's a real person uh, in the world. And then he says, who will arise in the future with heavenly qualities and character. So Abdu'l-Baha never claimed to be this seventh angel. So uh, this is a prophecy, therefore, uh, of the coming of the establisher that would be in the future. And as we go through this, we'll see that Abdu'l-Baha gives the date uh, that this will occur. And there's, a, of course, we can boil it down to the name, date, address, and mission. That's what we're going to be looking at today to see if uh, we can uh, discover that from the prophecies. The seventh angel is a man qualified with heavenly attributes, who will arise with heavenly qualities and character. Voices will be raised, it means for and against, when they hear these claims, so that the appearance of the divine manifestation will be proclaimed and diffused. And that's what happened in Jerusalem. Jesus made a claim, he showed some proofs, and voices were raised for and against. They're even calling for rabbits at one point, the crowds uh, jeering, and this caused the manifestation to be pro of that day to be proclaimed and uh, diffused until it became the state religion of the Roman Empire. So uh, nobody said we were shy when it comes to controversy. Apparently God likes to uh, allow this to happen because it promulgates uh, the message. In the day of the manifestation of the Lord of hosts and at the epoch of the divine cycle of the omnipotent, which is promised and mentioned in all the books and writings of the prophets. In that day of God, the spiritual and divine kingdom will be established. So we know that this is a person that will establish the kingdom, so he's the establisher. The kingdom will be established. The world will be renewed. A new spirit will breathe into the body of creation. The season of the divine spring will come. The clouds of mercy will rain. The sun of reality will shine. The life-giving breeze will blow. The world of humanity will wear a new garment. The surface of the earth will become a sublime paradise. Mankind will be educated. Wars, disputes, quarrels, and malignity will disappear. And truthfulness, righteousness, honesty, and the worship of God will appear. Union, love, and brotherhood will surround the world. And God will rule forevermore, meaning that the spiritual and everlasting kingdom 
will be established. So you have him telling us twice that this is the establishment or the establishment of the kingdom. Such is the day of God. For all the days which have come and gone were the days of Abraham, Moses, and Christ, or of the other prophets. But this day is the day of God, for the sun of reality will arise in it with the utmost warmth and splendor. And he says, In that day of the manifestation of the Lord of hosts, and at the epoch of the divine cycle of the omnipotent, is when this will happen. Well, when he says epoch, we'll find out in another tablet that's recorded in Baha'u'llah in the New Era that we'll read later. Uh, he's talking about the um, jubilee, the hundred-year jubilee, or the epoch, the hundred-year epoch of the proclamation of Baha'u'llah on April 21st, um, 1863, brings us to April 21st, 1963. And that's those from the victory of Muhammad in 628 AD, there's 1,335 solar years to, uh, to 1963, which is the victory when this establisher would come. And the victory is we now have the language and the knowledge uh, to communicate this message, because this kingdom is established through education. That's what he said. The wars would disappear, and an education would come forward at this time. So uh, it might be difficult for materialists to understand uh, what this means, but if we think about it in these terms, uh, when Einstein, for instance, discovered, discovered e equals mc squared, this was a huge breakthrough. And so at that moment that he discovered that, we entered into the atomic age, even though they didn't detonate the bomb until 50 years later, or uh, make the, uh, understand quantum electrodynamics, uh, be able to make the computer chip. But if it wasn't for that epoch-making, scientific discovery, that was the victory that led us into this technology age. Remember Galileo uh, said, that, and Copernicus was saying the earth was round, and, uh, but the people believed it was flat, and he was put in prison. Okay, well this just isn't uh, just an interesting story. Uh, later on, a man that believed in this, he said, well, if the earth's round and a magnet, a compass, uh, points north, there, there must be some magnetism involved in the earth. So he made a little mini model earth that was round. And he says if it orbits the sun, it, that means the sun isn't moving, the earth is spinning around its own axis. What would happen if I made, if I took a magnet and uh, put north up here and south here, so the compass points there, and made a miniature earth and spun it around its own axis as fast as possible? Because he believed that this was the reality, and he discovered the electric generator. And then uh, if you, uh, if you uh, put electricity into that, that's the electric motor. If you spin it from some other means, it puts electricity out, and if you put electricity into it, it spins. Now, everything we have today is based upon electricity and the motor and the generator. Even this coal that they're shipping out here, they're burning to spin these big turbines with steam power, you know, to uh, produce electricity. So when Galileo was under house arrest for this, he, was, uh, he didn't have electricity and the washing machine and the light bulb and all of these conveniences. The computer and the internet runs on it. So that battle between the earth being flat and the earth being a globe was actually for all of our modern electrical motors and generators and conveniences is what it turned out to be about. And that's what Christ said, to seek the truth and the truth will set you free. Can you imagine spending all day long doing your laundry today? We don't, you know, we just toss it in and push, go and leave. You know, we, that's what we're free to do other things. So what on the surface might look... Uh, like a silly argument over whether the earth's flat or round, and why are they imprisoning Galileo, it has a deeper significance to it. So the great victory uh, that we'll see of the coming of the Establisher is that now we have the word and the proof and the science. What he brought was the scientific approach uh, that we then see uh, in perfecting these firesides that had begun with Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And, uh, so we've already been exposed to uh, a great deal of uh, the innovations from this uh, great world teacher. Okay, well, anybody can claim to be a great world teacher, so, uh, but at least now we can see there's a, definitely a prophecy for the coming of this one. We know it wasn't Abdul Baha, because he said it would be in the future. We know it wasn't Shoghi Effendi, because Shoghi Effendi died in 1957. So, and this one would come in 1963. So, it's someone else. But before we get into uh, the actual uh, biblical proofs, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the life of Dr. Leland Jensen. And it's germane uh, to this. And uh, we'll understand uh, how he came about later of uh, finding out that he fulfilled uh, this role. So in the first place, he was the third generation Baha'i on his mother's side. His grandparents, his mother's parents were Baha'i. <coughs> his mother was Daisy Dell Peterson, and uh, his father was uh, Chris Jensen. 
and uh, his name was spelled Christ, C R C H R I S T, but the T silent. So they call him Chris. And he'd come from uh, a background uh, in some one of the Protestant religions. I think he was a deacon in the church. He was actually born in Denmark, but when he was a little boy, uh, his uh, father moved here to the United States. Well, they're both Danes. Uh, Jensen is S E N, and Peterson is S E N. And that's uh, the indication of, of Danish uh, origin. Well, in uh, my own research, and he had indicated this too, uh, the Danes uh, go back to the tribe of Dan uh, from into the uh, Old Testament uh, times, and they claim this in the history of the Danish people. That uh, when Shalomancer V came and sacked the ten northern tribes, he brought them into captivity. And he brought, uh, among them was half the tribe of Dan. And then this tribe of Dan uh, was too smart to stay in captivity, and they migrated out of Persian north, and they followed these rivers that they named after themselves, like the Dan Ube and stuff like this, until they came to Dan's Mark. The other half of them got on boats and left before the invasion took, and they went uh, <coughs> over to uh, England, Ireland, and Scotland. And they established places like uh, uh, Lund Dan, uh, and then uh, Dun's Marsh, and then these became the Scandinavian uh, civilization. So the legends of the Vikings, of Odin and Thor and the Yggdrasil tree with nine worlds, corresponds to the Mosaic revelation of the, uh, the Ten Commandments being like the nine worlds on the Kabbalah tree, and the tenth one being the land that the tree grows out of. And Odin was Adam, another name for Adam. And they weren't pagans. They believed in an infinite, invisible creator of the universe and everything in it. They called the All-Father. So uh, when the Christian Trinitarians went up there later, after Christianity had been hijacked by Theodosius, uh, they decried these monotheists as pagans and uh, started to uh, wipe them out. But there were a core of them that were uh, monotheistic and believed in the one true invisible God. So Herbert Armstrong and uh, some of the people in the, that background that are in England know the history of the tribe of Dan coming up there. In their ancient legends, they're called the Tawatha Dadanan, which is the tribe of Dan. And uh, we have a whole deepening that gets into uh, uh, just that history. So anyway, that's known. It's not just uh, something that we're saying. So uh, Doc's uh, grandfather was a blacksmith, and uh, the blacksmiths in, uh, in Denmark were the judges in the villages uh, for whatever reason. And so th and they, in order to have that position of uh, the blacksmith, uh, they had to be linked to the royal line of uh, Denmark. So he's a descendant of the tribe of Dan as well. So anyway, his father, uh, Chris, Chris Jensen, uh, came, was born in Denmark, and then uh, uh, his grandfather moved to the United States. And back then, um, the uh, immigrants coming in from Denmark would come to Ellis Island in New York, where the Statue of Liberty is, and they didn't speak any English, uh, but they'd say, Mitchell Lewis Wagon Shop. And uh, <laughs> this was a, a wagon factory, or the Mitchell Lewis Wagon Shop is outside of, uh, it's in Wisconsin. Uh, I think it might have been near Racine, Wisconsin, in that area. And all the Danes would get off the boat and say, Mitchell Lewis Wagon Shop, and then they would tell them how to <laughs> get out to the Wisconsin area. And Madison, where I lived for a while, was situated in Dane County. And then you have the Vikings out there in Minnesota, so there's a huge Danish... Uh, and Scandinavian uh, population in Minis Minnesota <laughs> and in Wisconsin. They have a access, an, an accent uh, out in that area. <coughs> we'll touch upon that a little bit more uh, uh, later. So, uh, to make a long story short, uh, when uh, the Baha'i Faith was first brought to the United States in 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair, and uh, this area with the, that had this large Scandinavian populations just north of Chicago. And then uh, later, uh, one of the first Baha'i teachers in that area uh, that had become a believer in the Middle East had moved here and started teaching uh, the firesides as Abdul Baha had explained them uh, from the perspective of the Bible so that the Christian people of the West could understand this. And um, a huge community developed in that area. So the largest Baha'i community in the United States, and the first one was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And there was uh, several hundred, if not a thousand, uh, different uh, fam members and all the members of the family involved in that. What finally got to such a pitch that uh, when the Young Turk Revolt happened and Abdul Baha was freed from prison, he was able to come uh, to the United States. And first he went to uh, Europe and then England. 
And the Baha'is came up to him when he was about to come to America, and uh, they said that we've got your tickets uh, to come to the United States. And he looked at them and he says, well, those aren't my tickets. And they says, yeah, there's your name on them. These are your tickets. And they were tickets for the Titanic, which was going to sail its maiden voyage from uh, England, uh, probably to New York. And uh, he says, those are not my tickets. You know, he re so he refused to get on the boat. So the Baha'is got on the boat, and they said, well, we'll see you there uh, later. And he wound up taking the USS uh, Cedric. So later, when he landed in New York, the tit you know, the story of the Titanic, the unsinkable Molly Brown, they asked him, why didn't you get on the boat? And he said, well, over the gangway, uh, when he walked on the ship, they were so proud of their boat, they said, and it was advertised in the paper like this, too, they, it said on it, uh, this is the ship that uh, even God can't sink. So Abdul Baha said, so he sank it. <laughs> he wasn't going to get on a boat, but they said, this is the ship that God can't sink. Wow. That's why he didn't get on the boat. So anyway, he landed in New York on April 4th of, uh, of 1912, uh, uh, and then uh, he began his tour, and he wound up traveling all the way from New York, and he spoke before Congress in Washington to uh, California and back again, and he came to Chicago, and uh, he went up, uh, he took a train up to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where this large Baha'i community was. And they had some sort of a farmhouse, maybe a little bit bigger than this, uh, where all the Baha'is were going to uh, meet Abdul Baha. So when he was uh, leaving Chicago, they said, uh, we've got your tickets you know, for this train that's going to be heading up uh, to Kenosha. And he says, those are not my tickets. And they said, well, sure they are. See, they've got your name on them. <laughs> and he says, those are not my tickets. So they separated themselves from Abdul Baha, and they got on the train, and they said, well, we'll be up there first. And they left. And the train was derailed. Nobody was hurt. And so it was on the side of the road. And the next thing they know, here comes another train, the next train whizzing by them. And there's Abdul Baha waving a white hanky, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, out, out, of, out the window. You know, like this. You know, you can actually have a white hanky, sort of like this. <laughs> OK, so when he came up to uh, Kenosha, uh, the, uh, the, he took a car. And they were driving over to the farmhouse. And uh, the, the, there was a throng of people, you know, over a hundred, hundred, several hundred people. Uh, when they saw the car come up, they rushed out the front door, and they were packing the yard and the car. And there was only a few people that stayed in the house, maybe about the same number that we have here. They were calmly sitting, you know, in chairs. And they just figured, well, they just wouldn't get to meet Abdul Baha, you know, because of the mob scene. And uh, they were sitting around the room, and uh, th some of the ones that were there was uh, Doc's mother, uh, Daisy, uh, Del Peterson and uh, Chris, his father, Chris Jensen, they'd already married at that point. And uh, Daisy was sitting by the door, uh, the back sc side screen door, like you're sitting by that door. And all of a sudden, Abdul Baha walks in uh, the side door. And there's this huge mob of people out in the front of the building, and their car pulls up. Where's Abdul Baha? They can't find him. Well, Abdul Baha knew what they were up to, so he had the driver <laughs> let him out of the car about a block from the house. <laughs> And then the car pulled up, and all these people thronged out of the room, a rushing, and he quietly walked in the, the side screen door, and they all, it's you, you know, they were surprised. Well, he carried some adder of rose oil with him, and he anointed everybody in the room. He started with Daisy, and he went around the room, and then he came back and he anointed her uh, uh, twice. And uh, this is what they were saying, is the first will be last, uh, and the last will be first, because she was anointed first, and... Uh, she was anointed last. And uh, also this was some indication that he knew that she was going to be the mother uh, of the uh, establisher uh, of the faith. And uh, uh, there's some indication of that uh, at that time. Well, when they all found out that, uh, where's Abdul Baha? He's already in the house. Then the big mob runs back to the door and they can't, they're, can't, they're trying to press them to the door and they can't get in. And uh, that was the same thing, that here they thought they'd be first and now they were all last, whereas the people that were calm and had these qualities and attributes of patience and things like this. They were the first to meet him, whereas it, they thought at first that they would uh, be last. So they were Baha'is. They met Abdul Baha. And then uh, in 1914, uh, Dr. Jensen was born on August 22nd. That makes him a Leo. And this is just a few days after the start of World War I and corresponds with the date Russell found when he said uh, Jesus would uh, come again. That uh, he believed, And that the sign that Jesus had returned was the... Uh, World War One had uh, taken place. <coughs> and so he was raised in the Baha'i faith uh, for the first seven years of Dr. Jensen's life, and I'll call him Doc or Leland. Uh, 
he went to school with his little pals, and they'd say, you know, uh, well, we're going to church on Sunday. Uh, what church do you go to? And he says, well, I'm a Baha'i. They'd be like, Baha'i, ha, 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 that sounds so funny. What's that? <laughs> and so he'd explain it to them as he could, and then they were like, oh, okay. And so they accepted him uh, and the fact that he was a Baha'i from a little age. So from a little age on the playground and in school, he started to learn how to communicate uh, about what the Baha'i faith was uh, to his friends. And uh, later, uh, and then they accepted it. They weren't prejudicial. You know, it's like, oh, okay. And so uh, he got along very well with the people. And he used to go out with his father when he was a little older, who would uh, um, uh, go to talk to go to different churches and then talk with the ministers after the services and stuff like this. And he, this is how he started to become educated in the prophecies at a young age and how it was biblically based. And because the other kids were Christian, and he told them he believed in the Bible too, they accepted him readily. Mm -hmm. So he showed what he, he taught what they had in common. And so obviously the Baptist said something different than the Catholic, but they, were all, but they all accepted each other because they believed in Jesus, well so do we. And so he showed, hey see, we have all this in common. So uh, he just didn't have any divisions or problems from the time he was a little kid. He learned this style and this method. So when he was seven years old, the Baha'i community at that point, they moved from Racine to Kenosha. I'm not exactly sure where they were living at this time, but there was about 1,000 or 3,000 people at this point. Uh, time had gone by. It was after World War I. Uh, after World War I in 1914, the Baha'i faith almost doubled in size in the United States from what it had been because of the war. It made people hungry for peace and spirituality uh, and the, uh, the, uh, these type of things. And... Uh, uh, they got they got word that uh, Abdul Baha had passed on, had ascended on November 28th of 1921. So Doc was seven years old when this happened, and he remembers when he was a seven-year-old boy standing in the living room of their house, and they had a big grand piano there, and one of his dad's friends, Mr. Bilotti, had come by, and he was pounding, pounding on the grand piano, uh, cursing and swearing and calling Shoki Effendi uh, every single name in the book. Who is this Shoghi Effendi you think he is, so and so this, blah, 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 and denouncing Shoghi Effendi as a violator of the covenant, all of this stuff. So Doc said to his dad, what's wrong with Mr. Bilotti? He was the nicest, kindest, friendliest man that, you know, and they had a neighbor there that they knew. See him at all the Baha'i feasts, and next thing you know, it's... So, uh, his, his he never heard his father swear or curse once the whole time he was growing up. His father said, well, son... Uh, Mr. Bilotti's breaking the covenant. Abdul Baha's written a will and testament, and he's named uh, Shoghi Effendi to be Muhammad Ali's replacement. He's the second successor before the House of Justice, and uh, he's called this position, uh, he's, he's instituted a new institution called the Guardianship of the Cause of God that's going to continue you know, on forever in the will and testament. And, uh, and Doc was old, oh. and he was seven, so he, you know, and he'd been participating in a lot of this. So when he was alone, he uh, said he turned to God when he was alone. He's just a little kid, you know, and he says, "If anybody ever comes against the guardianship, uh, I will stand forward and defend this, you know. And if anybody, in other words, ever tries to go against that will and testament of Abdul Baha, that document, because that's how they were trying to get rid of Shoghi Effendi by putting down the document. He says, "I'll defend every single, every single last." provision of that will, sacred will and testament of Abdul Baha to my dying breath. You know, he's a little kid, he swore this. Well, he never thought he'd be called on account to fulfill something like that, but that was the position that he took when he was uh, seven. He kind of made this personal oath with God and, and himself. Well, so at this point, it's 1951, and Shoki Effendi put out a call for what he called the 10-year uh, world crusade. And Opal said, Lee, let's participate in this. They went as far away from uh, the Rocky Mountains as you could go around the globe without coming back again to two little small islands called Reunion Island and Mauritius. And uh, Reunion Island is a French protectorate, so they just spoke French on that island, and Mauritius Island was under the British mandate. So when he arrived at the island, uh, he found out that Chogi Effendi had stated that these pioneers were now to be the Knights of Baha'u'llah. They gave them this title, the Knights of Baha'u'llah. And he said that uh, had he known that in volunteering to do that, they would have gotten this title, Knights of Baha'u'llah, he never would have went. That he had eschewed all administrative positions and titles uh, in the faith uh, ever since he was a kid. What had happened before that is there had been a Baha'i teacher that had come through the island in the sh uh, sugar trade business named Cheyenne. And he stayed in this hotel, and these two Jehovah Witnesses named Ferry and Theodore uh, had come to him to convert him to be JW. They knocked on his door. You know, they go door to door. 
And instead, he had told them about the Baha'i faith, and he converted them. <laughs> and he told them that they'd be the pillars, because they were the first two believers on the island. So he said, you're the pillars of this community. And then he'd left. So when Dr. Jensen went there and raised up this group, Ferry and Theodore were there, and while he was gone, Ferry and Theodore had made a proclamation, and they were teaching that Shoghi Effendi was a pimp, and that they were the pillars, and that everybody should turn to them. And that's what they were saying. So uh, when Doc came back, he's like, what's going on here? You know, and, o and Opal told him, he says, well, why didn't you do anything about it? And he goes, what was I going to do? So he goes and has a meeting with them, and uh, the whole thing has uh, uh, kind of fallen apart in this type of a way, and he's able to rescue a, a group of them. Well, meanwhile, the National Spiritual Regional National Assembly uh, sent investigators down to find out what was going on on the island. And so uh, the investigators was John Robards and his wife came down there. And they first they met with Ferry and Theodore. And uh, Ferry and Theodore took them out, wine and dine them, and so forth, and uh, blamed the whole thing on the Jensens. And then uh, the <laughs> Robards came over and met with uh, uh, Doc and Opal, and they only talked to them for about five or six minutes, and they left. And so uh, then they got word, uh, came down from that National Spiritual Assembly, to, telling them to leave the island. So then Dr. Jensen had written, they'd written to Shoghi Effendi at that time, and he told them to obey the National Spiritual Assembly. Yeah. So they were like, huh, what's going on here, you know? So they packed their bags uh, to go, and their work was done on both the islands anyway. And uh, it was very disillusioning uh, and disappointing, you know. So uh, while they were leaving uh, the island of Mauritius, they were getting on the boat, uh, the Leslie Likes uh, line, to come back uh, to the United States. That landed, in, uh, again, in Louisiana when they come back at that time. And uh, Bill Sears uh, comes running uh, you know, down the, uh, the gangway, you know. Dr. Jensen, Dr. Jensen, you know. Uh, don't go, don't go. And the doc turns around and uh, Bill Sears uh, falls on the ground in front of him on his knees and grabs him by the trousers. And Doc said, with tears as big as horse turds <laughs> in his eyes, uh, he says, uh, you don't have to leave the island. Uh, Shoghi Effendi has exonerated you, and uh, they, you know, they now know the truth of this uh, whole thing. Well, when Doc saw this person supposed to be a hand of the cause of God, which Bill Sears was, you know, uh, just crying in this phony type of a way, and Shoghi Effendi sent him all the way across the continent of Africa to do this, uh, he saw that this corruption that started with Ferry and Theodore and then uh, the Robarbs, it just went all the way up to the top, you know, all the way up to the hands. And so the, him and Opal were disillusioned, uh, but they finished their pioneering mission there and they came back to the United States. When they got here, in the time they were gone, they saw that it was just that much worse here in the United States. And that uh, the local assemblies here were uh, very controlling and corrupt. And uh, the National Assembly in the United States, Chicago, was no better. He had that experience overseas with the hands and the boards of protection and the examiners. And so uh, him and Opal had had it, you know. And so they'd come back here for a little while. And when he had uh, left, he'd taken this brand new Chrysler he'd bought and put it in storage. So here's a car that he'd never driven. He made a, a trailer himself uh, that he welded together with wood. And they put all their belongings in it. They decided to go down to Par and the Pioneer Paraguay. And Paraguay was known as a military dictatorship, uh, more or less, and it was known that like Christian missionaries and stuff would go down there and vanish and never be heard from again. So you can imagine the condition of uh, things in the United States for, to for motivate them to just want to move down to Paraguay, and they said, we'll live in a community of real Baha'is that we'll raise up ourselves in an area like that. So they got in their car, and they headed out <clears throat> from St. Louis, uh, and they were going down through Texas, and they got as far as El Paso, and they got the Asian flu. And uh, they both became so sick from this, uh, but being doctors of natural medicine, they knew what to do. They got a hotel room, and they got a bed there, and they took a, a lemon juice and a water fast. And went on a de-churge and uh, the, um, the, uh, the internal cleanse. The internal cleanse eliminates enema. You drink a salt solution in water that's the same as your blood. You drink it, just flushes everything out of your system. A lot of these viruses will live in the colon and things like this. And so the deterge and the internal cleanse and the fasting of the water and uh, the uh, lemon, they survived this after about a week. You know, they were recovered well, or two. And so in the Baha'i faith, things happen very rapidly. Uh, there's always something new uh, happening. So they decided that before they left the country, they might call up the local group there in El Paso to see if anything at all uh, had taken place. And so they call them up and said, uh, 
and told them that they happened to be in town. And they said, oh, oh, you were having a meeting, a feast tonight, as a matter of fact, you want to come by. Uh, something very important has happened. Shoghi Effendi has died. So they went to the local uh, meeting there where they had the feast, and they had these cablegrams. And they had this first cablegram was sent from the International Baha'i Council to all the nationals, and it said Shoghi Effendi was sick and uh, that they should pray for him. But it, and it was signed from Rio Canoe, because she was the liaison officer of the uh, International Baha'i Council, but it was sent through the secretary. And then they saw the second cablegram, uh, and it said uh, uh, Shoghi Effendi has died, and it was from the International Baha'i Council, and that the hands were going to meet in London, uh, to, uh, and there being further messages uh, coming. And uh, when they had that second one, they'd already known that the Shoghi Effendi's actual time of death is that he had died before the first one was sent out when it said he was just sick. So already, uh, they, were in the, they were sitting in the room, and Doc was like, what? You know, what's, what, what's up with this? So then the third cablegram was sent directly from Ria Kanum from London to the National Spiritual Assemblies, to them, to the local, saying that the hands were going to meet in the Holy Land, uh, and they would decide the future affairs of the faith. And immediately, the red light went on, the giant red flare went up in his mind, saying, well, you, after Shoghi Effendi, we turn to the House of Justice. There's two successors, and then this House of Justice. And uh, even if you don't see it like that, the successor to Shoghi Effendi at least would have to be some type of a guardian that would uh, also be telling us what would be in future for the faith, but not the hands. They were out of work. When Shoghi Effendi died, they ceased to be hands. Then they had the decision of the hands, and then they had this edict in front of them, which we have a photostatic copy of all the signature page, and the text of it's published. It's in Baha'i World, Volume 13. I have that in the office, the archive, plus Ministry of the Custodians. We have the original uh, distribution of it in Baha'i volume, World, Volume 13. And it says that because Shoghi Effendi had no son, and he left no will, therefore the guardianship has come to an end, and the hands are now in charge of everything. Okay? And, uh, you know, this, and it was signed by all 27 of them, including Mason Remy's signatures on there. Okay? So he took one look at that, and it, it, this, if this wasn't covenant breaking in its worst form, uh, nothing else would ever be. And he was about to say something, and then he says Opal ribbed him one. <laughs> you know, because everybody in the room had gobbled it up, and it said that if the believers were even to discuss the issue of the guardianship, that they should re be reported by the other believers so they can be immediately excommunicated, making the whole issue a taboo. And this is what brought the great oppression uh, down upon all the Baha'i people uh, at that time. So she ripped him one and he was a hmm. So later on he talked to her and he swore that if any one of those uh, hands that had signed that document ever came forward and tried to say that they were a type of a guardian or what have you, he would never accept any of them. So they're all crooks. <clears throat> so 1957 went by, 1958, 1959, 1960, so now it's Rizwan of 1960, uh, all of the Baha'is are in this administration, it's been hijacked by the hands, nobody has any idea if there's a guardianship or not, so they're kind of in limbo uh, on that one. And so uh, the teaching effort has kind of slowed down because he doesn't want to bring people into the cause during that time and had turned them over to the hands. And him and Opal now are living in Joplin, Missouri, and uh, she was the secretary of the local spiritual assembly there. So she gets this mailer. She opens it up, and it's the proclamation of Mason Remy uh, as the next guardian of the faith. And in it, it says that, And Ashoghi Effendi uh, appointed me and no one else to be president of that first international Baha'i Council. <coughs> and on the will and testament on page 14, as that international Baha'i Council is the House of Justice, on Will and Testament, page 14, the President of the House of Justice is there for the Guardian, therefore I'm the succeeding Guardian of the Bible. And she showed it to Doc, and he immediately accepted him. So he said he'd never accept anybody that signed that document, but, <laughs> but then he saw those proofs, and he always went by uh, the proofs, and the criteria fulfilled. And that criteria on page 14 seals it. And the cablegrams were authentic from showing the Effendi naming him. Nobody, even the other side, doesn't disagree that he's President of that IBC. They just, uh, you know, have reasons of their own for uh, um, dissembling. So, uh, now they knew who the Guardian was. They were excited. But they were in these communities uh, that were in intellectual opposition. And uh, Mason Remy had sent a copy of this to all of the local spiritual assemblies. 
and the National Spiritual Assembly in the United States, saying they should prepare uh, to, for him to appear before the national gathering uh, during Rizwan of 1960, that they should have a car waiting for him at the airport, and they can pick him up as the guardian and bring him to the meeting, and then he would be able to address the council and answer people's questions and allow the people time to independently investigate the truth and so that everybody could have time, he said, to make the necessary adjustments one way or the other that they want to do. So it wasn't like, accept this or else. It was, you know, okay, here's the information now, and we can uh, discuss it. So immediately the hand sent a missive out from the Holy Land saying, We, the hands of the cause of God, who are no longer hands, uh, excommunicate Mason Remy from the Baha'i Faith as a covenant breaker. And they said the old man, after years of service, he uh, was born in 1874, so in 1960 uh, he was 80 something. <clears throat> and so he said he's in his dotage, uh, but nevertheless he's in violation of the covenant. And in the Will and Testament, uh, it states this um, on page uh, 20. And now, one of the greatest and most fundamental principles of the cause of God is to shun and avoid entirely the covenant breakers, for they will utterly destroy the cause of God, exterminate his law, and render of no account all efforts exerted in the past. So no matter how many efforts we've exerted in the past, uh, I've seen this happen, it does render everything to no account. Uh, Okay, and so they used this verse and said that now Mason Remy is a covenant breaker and this applies to him. Now, oh, wait, wait, wait. We read all the salient passages about the hands yesterday. Nowhere, no how, did this document ever give the hands any authority to determine or declare if somebody was in the spiritually sick condition of violation of the covenant or not. So, sure, it says that we should shut and avoid the violators, but who are they to say who is or isn't uh, a violator? We've had people come through here that people swore were violators, and we said, no, they're not. They're just having personal issues. Leave them alone. And then they've recovered from this. So this, this is a very serious thing to uh, say something like this uh, for that individual. And it's not to be taken lightly. And the hands are given no authority to determine this. So in a, in, a, in a stroke of satanic genius, in a clever switcheroo, Mason had let them get in the saddle for those three years, they were able to declare all the people that were firm in the covenant as violators and get everybody under their oppression that was forbidden to even talk about the guardianship to continuing, to be all frightened of contag contagion, some spiritual disease, if they were to associate with Mason or anybody that might know about the guardianship. When in reality, the hands were the covenant breakers that were in violation of the will and testament. And now these poor saps, these people, were trapped under this hollow blue of the hands. Anyway, uh, so he decided to have a deepening on the covenant. So he had him come over for a session like this and deep, let's deepen on the covenant now that all these issues of the covenant are being spoken of. See? And that's a pretty good way to break the ice. And so they started with the Bible, and it says, uh, And in the beginning uh, God covenanted, let us make man after our image and our likeness. And he talked about how the us and the hour are the progressive manifestations we become made in the image of God. And then it says that Noah inherited this, and Abraham, and we read the kingship and all of that. And then he went all the way, he found this writing from Abdu'l-Baha, where he says, uh, Moses made a strong covenant of Jesus to come after him. Jesus made a strong covenant of Muhammad to come after him, and then Muhammad won the Bab. The Bab made a covenant of him whom God shall make manifest will come. That's what the Bab called Baha'u'llah, him whom God shall make manifest. Baha'u'llah wrote a strong covenant of the Kitab Yad. They made Abdul Baha to be the successor. They read writings about the importance of the Kitab Yad and about Muhammad Ali, and then they read the Will and Testament, and then they were in the Will and Testament. <laughs> And uh, they get to that part about the guardianship that we were reading uh, the other night. This one guy in the room says, uh, he says, uh, oh, oh, there has to be a guardian. Wait a minute. We're, this whole thing that the hands are putting forth, this is, uh, this is all a uh, hooey. And it, it doesn't say anywhere that they have the right to expel anybody. This is a big repression put down on us. And he says, uh, if Dr. Jensen, if you don't produce a guardian, uh, if there is no guardian, this faith's bunk. And I'm chucking it all. And he's like, okay, okay, calm down, we're not done reading the Will and Testament. So then they kept reading it, then they got to the page 14 where it mentions the House of Justice, and the same guy jumped up, he says, that's it. He says, uh, there, you, know, uh, I, you know, we already knew that this guardianship had to continue after reading this, and uh, 
uh, it's Mason Remy, isn't it? Is, 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 there, is he the guardian or not? You know, he starts yelling. He goes, oh, calm down. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, let's look at what his claim is. And he pulled out the proclamation of Mason, and they read how he said he was the president of the IBC, which is the UHA, and page 14, that's the guardian. They all accepted it. That's how he saved his whole community. Now, if he would have just come out there and said, hey, by the way, let's talk about the guardianship, this was taboo. If you even mentioned it, you were out. And if you mention Mason Remy's name at that time, buzzword, you're out. See? So he didn't do that. He started at a deepening, and by the time he got into the will without mentioning anything, they were uh, saying, where is it? See? So you have to kind of be savvy if you're going to help people out of this. And they saw it with their own eyes. They all accepted Mason. When Mason came to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Doc went out there with uh, Count Harvey, uh, which was a good friend of his, and his wife, Pearl Harvey, and uh, they all three of them drove in this car, and they met uh, Mason in Washington, D.C., later on. And uh, he was uh, kind of tired. He'd get tired now and then. He was sleeping. He'd rest in this room in the back, and then he'd come out, and they'd have, uh, like, a fireside chats in the afternoon and one in the evening. So he got to meet Mason Remy in person. And uh, when they first got there, Mason Remy uh, came out, and he they sat on the couch, and he kind of talked to them in couch talk. And he says... To them, the first thing he says when he comes out, he addresses them. He says, "Now you've passed the first test." And they said, "Test?" And he'd been a Baha'i his whole life. He'd never heard of this thing in his life. He says, "What do you mean test?" He says, "Now you know the guardianship will never end, See? because these people said it ended, and now they said it didn't. So they knew for sure it would never end." He says, "Now I myself am going to test you again." So he said he was going to test them. He says, "Next time you won't know who the next guardian is for a little while." So they're like, oh. And then he went on this, uh, what seemed to be a tangent. He pulled out this medallion he had made, and it had 19 uh, parts to it. It had eight, a gold chain with 18 gold links, and the medallion was the 19th on it. And it was a round medallion with nine, a pointed star, with nine diamonds embedded uh, on the points. And one of Mason Remy's number nines, a special, arch he was an architect, an architectural art deco type uh, nine that Mason used to draw it. He's actually the designer of many of the Baha'i temples around the world and the shrines of Mount Carmel. He finished the Golden Dome of the Bab. This is his architecture. Uh, Sutherland Maxwell was also an architect. He did the first part of the architectural design of the Shrine of the Bab, but then he passed on and then Mason completed it. So, and plus uh, all the other temples and things. So anyway, and Abdul Baha commissioned him uh, to do the design for the main Mashri Kalaskar to be built on Mount Carmel. And uh, we have those plans and blueprints still. And it's never been built. It might be built in the future. So anyway, uh, he says, now, this medallion, and he passed it around the room, they got to feel it and hold it. He says, the reason that I happen to have it made is that uh, in the Holy Land, you have all these different religions in the state of Israel. But the Catholics have, like, an archbishop there, or a cardinal or something like that, or an archbishop. And then you have the Greek Orthodox Church has a bishop there. But the headquarters of these are in Rome or Armenia or somewhere else. And only the Baha'i faith has the actual head of the world religion, the world headquarters in Israel. So when they have these state meetings, like they had the funeral for Ben Gurion or someone else, a state official like that, Ashoki Effendi would lead the procession. And so they have black and white movie tone newsreels of this funeral, and there's a five foot two man in a business suit wearing a red fez leading this parade, and behind him is Mason Remy, who's almost seven feet tall with his arms akimbo like this, walking behind him. It looks like a giant compared to Shoggy Fendi. And then uh, all behind him is these people in these big fish hats and flowing robes and cross ears and gold and jewels. And people are like, why is that little guy in the fez leading the parade? He must be pretty darn important. Look who's behind him <laughs> and all their costumes. So Mason said, so people wouldn't have a misconception if Mason was into pageantry like this, he made this medallion uh, to give it to Shoki Effendi to wear on just such an occasion. So then they could look down and see this gold medallion with a nine on it, and go, well, that's the guardian of the Baha'i faith that's leading the procession, Shoki Effendi. And he said, explained that uh, he never had an opportunity or an occasion uh, to give the medallion uh, to Shoki Effendi, because Shoki Effendi had uh, passed on. And he says, the one that you see that has this medallion after my passing, that will be the next guardian. So he said he was going to test them, that they wouldn't know who it is for a while, but then he gave the test away. So they asked him, is that how you're going to appoint him? And he said, no, absolutely not. And he re later explained that anybody could just steal the medallion. 
you know. And then what did they do? They claimed that they were the ones, so this is absolutely not the way he was going to appoint him. Okay, <coughs> so the faith started to grow and evolve under uh, Mason at that time. The Baha'is understood there were these tests. And now there was uh, several thousand in the states and others uh, around the world. The National Spiritual Assembly of France voted five to four to accept Mason Remy. And uh, other countries had come in, in Persia and Iran, all around the world. And uh, 1961 is rolling around. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> and so uh, uh, the, the group under Mason Remy, uh, they wanted to elect a National Spiritual Assembly under the guardianship or under the provisions of the covenant. And at that meeting uh, that they had, Dr. Jensen talked against this. That from his perspective, what he saw, that all the corruption came in due to these people jockeying for power positions in the administration instead of going out what they're supposed to do uh, in the Will and Testament, which is to teach the faith, which is the head cornerstone of the foundation itself. If we do these three things, if we live the life and teach the faith and affirm in the covenant, this is how we receive our rays of the Holy Spirit, uh, Abdul Baha tells us. So we should teach, teach, teach. And so these people weren't teaching, they were just administrating. And why? They thought when the calamity happened that their Baha'i administration would become the national government of what was left of the United States or France or Russia and that they'd be the world rulers. And this is where their heads were at. It wasn't about uh, knowing and loving God or uh, being servants to humanity. And Baha'u'llah himself says the leaders will be the leaders, but their hearts belong to God. He didn't say, if you join this, you'll become the governmental leader. And, uh, you know, and anyway, so they politicized the whole thing where these administrators were like one cast of people, and then you had the teachers and uh, the other ones. So Dr. Jensen was against uh, the idea of reestablishing the administration uh, under the guardianship because they just lost the majority of people, and he thought that uh, they needed to focus on the teaching effort, trying to save the waverers and the violation, and get them out of that administration so they could be under the covenant. Uh, and they need to have that for their safety and security and salvation anyway. So uh, he talked against it in, in 1960, and 60, or 61, 62. Well, Mason Remy had written to him and had heard about this, and they were in correspondence with each other by mail. And Mason, uh, he gets a letter from the Guardian, Mason, and he says, uh, Dr. Jensen, uh, you know, would it be all right with you if we did uh, ha set up a National Spiritual Assembly in America uh, under the guardianship like the people want? Uh, you know, wonder what conditions would, uh, you know, uh, would you think it might work? Or why are you against it, you know? And he thought this was strange. He got uh, the Guardian would ask him for his advice. And uh, this kind of baffled him because they weren't used to this. You didn't get a letter like that from Shoghi Effendi. <laughs> so he wrote him back and said why he was against it. And so then Mason wrote back and said, well, would it be okay with you uh, if, if the primary purpose uh, of the, that, that National Assembly was only for the teaching effort and saving the waverers, if that was the reason it was set up? And he wrote back and he said, yes, he would go along with it in that case. And so they scheduled to have an election of a National Spiritual Assembly under the hereditary guardianship, that's a mouthful, uh, under, uh, to take place in Rizwan of 1963, and it was scheduled to take place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so he showed up uh, during the Rizwan period uh, for the, the election of that National Spiritual Assembly. Well, there was another man at that time that had been with the hands in Pretty Firm, uh, but Mason had lived with him in Washington, D.C. for a while, and his name was Rex King. And that's not his real name. His, uh, given name was Reginald uh, or Rex and then his uh, last name was like a, some sort of a Polish name that ended with a ski or something that he was from Chicago and uh, they had a large Polish community there and uh, maybe not uh, to be uh, racial but just for humor they have a lot of jokes where they put down uh, the Polish people they call these Polish jokes maybe they're in bad taste maybe some were supposed to be for good humor but this kind of made him feel a little bit inferior in the community uh, for this and his father was some sort of a hardcore minister in one of the churches, and he was a big hypocrite. So because this uh, Rex King was uh, the preacher's son, uh, he had to uh, always be the best boy. He wouldn't let him run around with the tykes like you see all the kids doing out here. And he felt constrained, and then his father just did whatever the hell he want, heck he wanted anyway. And he felt his dad was a big hypocrite, and he wound up growing up hating his father, and hating Christianity, and hating the Christian church in this type of a way. And so he had a little bit of an insecurity or inferiority concept. 
So you overcome, this is the common cold of uh, psychological problems, the common cold. But anyway, he had it more deeply ingrained, and he overcompensated, always had to be the best uh, at everything. So he changed his name to Rex, which means king, and then he changed his last name to King, which means <laughs> king. <laughs> and so he's King King, you know what I mean? So uh, he got into acting, and he went out to Hollywood, uh, and uh, he was so persuasive, uh, and had some charisma that he was able to teach people. He come, they come to a Baha'i talk, and it wasn't quite like these talks that we've been experiencing. Uh, and he would tell them about uh, you know, the life of Baha'u'llah, and how he's put in the sea of call. He had people weeping. By the time he told them that Baha'u'llah was put in that black hood, they, they were just weeping and weeping, and the Baha'u'llah was smarter, they were weeping, weeping. And then he told them about how they got out and the cause had victories, and they were laughing and, and laughing, you know. And then he would tell them this, and they'd be mad and mad, and then he'd tell them this, and then they'd be. And by the time it's like a movie. So, you know, you go to a movie and you're, oh, you leave the movie. How was it? Wow! Uh, you know, what was it about? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so the time they were done, uh, they were like, oh, okay, this must, you know, they've had this experience. But he never once uh, implied that you should use your intellect. It's okay, to, like we've been having some fun here, but he never once explained that you can use your intellect to recognize the truth. So he wasn't teaching a proof uh, type thing, but he was very persuasive uh, and uh, entertaining uh, teacher, very successful. So Mason had lived with him in Washington, D.C., and suggested that somebody uh, write him a letter try to explain the proofs of the thing to him. So Brenda Norton said she'd do it, and he accepted. And so they used to say that Rex King was like a branch plucked out of the fire, uh, or a brand plucked out of the fire, because here he was slated for the hands, and then he'd come under the covenant. And they were all happy to have him because he was uh, such a uh, one of the active uh, teachers that was well known in that day. Well, he had relocated from Florida, uh, and he, he bought a ranch out there in Las Vegas, New Mexico, uh, north of Santa Fe. And so this uh, national gathering under the guardianship of Mason was scheduled to take place in Santa Fe, New Mexico on April 21st of 1963 during the 12 days of Rizwan. And Rex had been there since he lived there, right on the 21st, and Dr. Jensen showed up at the gathering, and he opens the door, and everybody's giving him the cold shoulder. And he's like, <laughs> you can meet, imagine, if you went from something like this to that, it would just be that abrupt. You'd wonder what was going on. So he was like, what's going on? And then, uh, you know, <laughs> you wonder if he had B.O. or something. <laughs> so uh, he's a very perceptive uh, person, and he starts looking around, and he notices, uh, Rex, uh, can I get you another cup of coffee? Rex, would you like the paper? Rex, can I shine your shoes? Rex, can I butter your buns? You know, <laughs> There's other words for this. And he's like, uh, well, what's going on here? So he's kind of in the sideline, and somebody comes over, and he goes, what's, what's going on here? He goes, haven't you heard? Haven't you heard? And he goes, no, <laughs> I haven't. He goes, yeah, he's got letters from Mason Remy. He's going to be the next guardian. And uh, Doc was like, what? And the letters didn't say anything about anything. It didn't say he was his son or he was appointed. They were just saying, Rex, uh, I've never met uh, such a great teacher as you. Uh, you're one of the best in the faith. Uh, we, you know, it's wonderful to have you under the covenant and stuff like this. And he was saying that these letters, uh, Mason and Senate, were to groom him, uh, were grooming him to be the next guardian. But nothing uh, along the lines of adoption or proofs or anything like this. So uh, then they went to have the election. So uh, the way the Baha'i election works is plurality ballot. There's no campaigning. So you just write down nine names, and the top nine that have the most votes, that's on the council. And uh, um, whereas, uh, then there's sometimes a tie. So whereas he, he when he, elections came, because once he was an active teacher, he might be elected in the top two or three uh, to the council, Dr. Jensen. Uh, I think there was a runoff, that he was tied for ninth with somebody, and then they had a runoff, and he'd gotten on there. So I think he'd barely gotten on there. And then the nine of them met to have the meeting. But so one of them stands up and says, I nominate Rex for chairperson of the council. And then everybody says, yeah, yes, yes. And then Rex says, well, I, I can't accept this position. You know, uh, thank you very much. I'm so humbled by this experience, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I, I think it's beyond you know, what I'm going to be able to do here. And so then they vote in uh, Audie Petzl, or I think. And then uh, Rex for vice president, same thing, no, no, no. And then um, the Charles, was it Charles Gaines? Yeah, Charles Gaines uh, gets to that position. And then they say, uh, Rex for secretary Rex says, you know, you, boy, you know, you want me for this and that. You know, I, I guess we're really not supposed to refuse office. 
in the Baha'i faith, uh, okay, you know, I won't say no, he gets elected as secretary. Well, the secretary of the Baha'i Council is the power position. It's like the secretary of the Communist Party in Russia. Uh, the, all the correspondence comes through, they have the roster, the mailing list, their control of the records and minutes of the meeting and all this. So they elect their uh, assembly and they start having these meetings and Rex starts making these motions to form this committee and that committee and this committee and to, to take over publications and, and uh, just make a huge administration out of it. And they start doing everything except trying to uh, teach the faith and save the wa waverers. So at the beginning of this, Dr. Jensen points out, look, we're supposed to uh, have this letter from the Guardian here that's, that says that we're supposed to focus on teaching the faith and saving the waivers. A lot of the people have written a lot of good literature and pamphlets explaining the proofs to save the people. Maybe we should focus on publishing those. And uh, Rex, they all say, okay, uh, bring in all the literature that everybody's written, and Rex says he'll take a look at it. So they all bring in the literature that's been written, and Rex says he'll take a look at it. They come back to the next meeting. He says, it's all garbage. I throw it in the trash. He says, from now on, only I or Charles Gaines uh, can write any of the official literature. <laughs> well, Charles Gaines was African-American, and it was civil rights at that time. He was patronizing Charles okay, uh, in this type of a way. And uh, Charles figured this out uh, as this went on. He wrote to Mason Remy, because it all became correct, corrupt under Rex, and he says, uh, Abdul Baha says if a religion becomes corrupt, it's a religious act to separate from it. And he says, I want, and he says besides, I want to work more in the civil rights movement and help my people. And this whole thing's corrupted by Rex. Uh, can I, I want to withdraw from the faith. And he got a letter back from Mason Remy saying, not only can you withdraw, but with my blessings. Mm -hmm. okay. So what took place at this point is that Dr. Jensen started writing to Mason saying, look, he's thrown out all the literature. They're doing everything but teaching the faith and saving the waverers. Uh, this, is, this is things out of control. And then he hires a lawyer to sue the, the Sands Guardians in... Um, in, uh, come to think of it, I forgot all about this, <laughs> to sue the Sands Guardians in Chicago for ownership of the temple in Wilmette. So they start pressing this uh, law case uh, against them, and now all the money, Rex and them are uh, uh, making an aggressive lawsuit against the main ones for control of the temple, saying they're the legitimate national spiritual assembly, not the one in Chicago. <laughs> so all of the stuff is now skewed away from teaching the faith and saving the waivers, and letters are coming, or streaming out of... Mason then moved to Florence, Italy with his adopted son, Pepe, uh, at that time, and letters are streaming out of Florence, Italy, cease and desist, cease and desist, cease and desist. And it just wouldn't stop. So finally, Rex decides to put Dr. Jensen on trial and have him excommunicated uh, from the Baha'i faith. Uh, and all the votes in that assembly were 8 to 1, 8 to 1, 8 to 1. And then Mason read me more letters, cease and desist, cease and desist. So Rex is just hijacking now the administration under the guardianship in America, and it's the, he's Horace Holly all over again, you know, ruling with an iron fist in these administrators. So needless to say, the election for the NSA in 1964 comes around and Dr. Jensen isn't re-elected.